Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started now. Um, good morning and welcome to Cal Poly's College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences uh, virtual open house event. Uh, we're excited that you could join us today. I'm Andy Thulin, I'm the Dean of the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences, and we have an exciting uh, agenda planned for you today. We're sorry that we can't meet in person as we normally do, but as you know, Cal Poly is hosting this its entire quarter virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We just wrapped up our second week of classes and by all accounts, it was, it's, uh, the wrinkles, any wrinkles have been smoothed out and the students have quickly adapted to this new learning environment. This situation has offered an un, unexpected uh, and unique opportunity for us to be creative about how we offer our very unique hands-on learning programs here at Cal Poly that we're well known for. For example, a food science professor has shipped jam making kits, fruit, pectin, sugar, and jars to students in her class, and they will be able to make jam together in their home kitchens. As long as the pandemic lasts, we will provide every learn by doing opportunity we possibly can while protecting the health and safety of our students, our faculty, and our staff. This time we, uh, we're hopeful that by the beginning of fall quarter, everyone will be back on campus and ready to experience learn by doing in, in person. Uh, but for your safety is our top priority and we will continue to follow state CDC and CSU guidelines for the coronavirus situation. We'll be ready to offer our courses uh, whether they're uh, in person or online in the fall. Uh, and it'll, and we're, we're committed to providing the same uh, outstanding learning experience that brought you to Cal Poly in the first place. Okay, so now let's take a quick look at a video of our students sharing why they chose Cal Poly. Hands-on philosophy, I really felt I could get the most out of my education with the Learn by Doing motto. I chose Cal Poly because as a high school student with my Future Farmers of America program, I came to, the, to Cal Poly and was able to see all the programs I had to offer, the wonderful faculty, the opportunities Learn by Doing, and it, I just saw myself here. And since I wanted to be an agriculture teacher, I knew this was the place to be. I chose Cal Poly because when I came and visited, I, as a transfer student, all of the staff was genuinely enthusiastic about the subjects they were teaching, which made me more excited to come here and study. Coming out of high school, I knew I wanted to do something in engineering, but I wasn't exactly sure what that was. And so Bray is, offers such a wide breadth of engineering principles, like water, mechanical, you get the civil stuff. And so it really gave me the time to get my hands dirty in it and see what my passion truly was. I chose Cal Poly because I wanted to go somewhere out of my comfort zone. I was really coming from Washington, D.C. I knew California would be really cool, and finding the major one in viticulture was something new and exciting. I chose Cal Poly because uh, a teacher I had in high school um, was really one of my mentors, and she went to Cal Poly, and she always talked about how great Cal Poly was and how much she's learned and how much she benefited from being a student here. Um, and I wanted that experience. I chose Cal Poly because I had family that were alumni. I knew that they were the only uh, dairy science major on the West Coast, and their Learn By Doing motto really um, called me in. Well, Cal Poly is a great ag school, and it always has been, and I've had my dad and seven of his siblings come to Cal Poly, so it's, I guess it kind of runs in the family. I chose Cal Poly because uh, they had classes in wildland firefighting, and um, I wanted to be a wildland firefighter, so the fact that they had those classes uh, kind of stood out to me. I love Cal Poly because of the people that I've met. I love interaction, and I like how, at least in agribusiness, everyone seems willing to help and wants to work on projects and homework and study together. And I, and I really, really appreciate that. I chose Cal Poly because it seemed really interesting. First, I didn't want to go here because it's where my whole family went. But then I looked really hard at the school and I came to open house. And it really just seemed like a great place to go. And I liked it more than any other schools I saw. I chose Cal Poly because every time I talked to anyone about it, all they had was good things to say. And that was not typical of all the universities. Uh, I chose Cal Poly because the location really, it's a beautiful area um, and they had the major, there's not that many, I think there's maybe like four or five schools that have nutrition and it just seemed like the best option. I chose Cal Poly because of all the schools I applied to and all the schools I got into, um, Cal Poly stood out to me by far, um, I heard a lot of really good things about it. I came to Cal Poly because the programs 
Um, I had learned a lot about the Learn by Doing motto when I was here on the tour, and um, I've always been a really hands-on person, so getting to actually uh, be out there in the field and taking samples or doing surveys and stuff like that just really appealed to me. I love Cal Poly because of the sense of community it gives its students. I love Cal Poly because everyone acts like a family. I love Cal Poly because um, all the land we have here, all the open space, the ag lands, the hills. I love Cal Poly because of all the things I can do. I love being able to go to the beach one day or going on a hike the other. I love Cal Poly because the people that I'm surrounded by and when I look around there's all these go-getters that are going to be the future industry leaders. Thank you. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce uh, to you some of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Richard Cavalletto. Hi, I'm Richard Cavalletto, the Executive Associate Dean for the college. I work with the undergraduate programs and uh, I'm also a Cal Poly graduate, uh, 1981 in uh, agricultural engineering. And Dr. Jim Prince. Hi, um, I'm Jim Prince, the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Programs. Those are my two main portfolios. I am not a Cal Poly alum, but both my daughters went to school here and they just loved it. Great. We're going to share some information about the college and ask that you hold your questions until the Q&A portion of the event. We're recording this session to post on our website for those uh, who were unable to attend, so, and also for you to refer back to. Uh, and we have the slides, please. Okay. So our application pool, once again, we received a large number of uh, applicants this year for a limited number of seats. We're down slightly over last year, uh, but this is a national uh, demographic that uh, a trend that we see across all universities. Uh, we had more than 63,000 applicants here at Cal Poly and in College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences, about 4,700 freshmen applied and 870 transfer applications applied. We have about 1,200 seats to fill. So I want to say for those of you that were conditionally accommodated, uh, you should be very proud, your parents should be very proud that you were admitted to Cal Poly because it continues to be a very competitive uh, uh, place to uh, get into. This next slide here shows the, our application process or, and the, the student profile that we have here. As you can see, uh, it's a combination of what classes you took, what grades you've got, and your test scores that results in a high brand value. The scores shown on the screen here are for the university overall, but for our college specifically, our average GPA for our first time freshman is 4.01, and for our transfer students, it's 3.33. The caliber of our students is amazing. As a result, Cal Poly graduates have a very high brand value when they enter the workforce. Now let's take a look at some of our college highlights. Um, the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences has nine departments with over 4,100 students. Uh, and we're the second largest land-based college in the state of California, uh, at Cal Poly is, with uh, over 10,000 acres. So a lot of open space to do learn by doing, uh, and it serves uh, all the colleges on, on our campus. We have nine departments and 15 majors. All of our departments are having Zoom meetings immediately following this presentation, so be sure to refer to the virtual open house web page for a full schedule. Um, as we look at this, you see the nine departments and then underneath those departments, you'll see the, um, uh, the majors that are represented in each of those departments. For example, uh, bioresource and ag engineering. Uh, they have two majors in that program called agriculture systems management and bioresource and agriculture engineering. If you look over at the natural resources management and environmental sciences department, we have three majors, and those majors, those majors are environmental earth and soil science, uh, environmental management and protection, and the forestry program. So each of these departments uh, may contain one or more, more majors. College is, uh, is <clears throat> college, uh, your four years at the university is a tremendous time of growth for, for young people. Experiences you have in the classroom, outside the classroom, with many clubs and activities, and competitions. Almost every program has uh, competitions where they compete against other universities in those. 
Um, I think we have probably close to 40 different clubs uh, and the various activities that you get exposed to um, provides for a huge opportunity to, to learn how to manage people, learn how to work in a team, learn how to be a leader and, uh, and get people to do things that they don't want to do and still do it with a smile on their face. So those are skills, those soft skills that are very important that over the four years, uh, you'll have a tremendous opportunity to, to uh, hone your skill set. A professional toolbox we often refer to is, you know, what is that professional toolbox that can take, allow you to go out into the world and accomplish great things? It's not just the courses, the science, the technology, the mathematics, and all those things. It's also those learning experiences of working in, a, um, in an environment where students with unlike backgrounds come together and learn how to work together to solve, uh, you know, these wicked problems in this, in this world. Uh, you, you learn the critical thinking skills, the scientific skills, and the research skills. Our undergraduate research program is very, very popular and allows us to make a network with our peers and, and the industry. Really, at the end of the day, I, I would suggest that Cal Poly, our real, real uh, uh, opportunity as a university is our ability to intersect with the industry. It's where the industry and the academy come together. It's where the academy, Cal Poly, comes together with uh, government agencies, with NGOs, with private industry uh, to uh, uh, provide not only leadership of young people going into those organizations, but it also gives the opportunity to uh, uh, allow our students to uh, prepare and, pre and uh, handle those, those wicked challenges that we have in our, uh, in our world today. So, Cal Poly students that graduate from the College of Agriculture, Food and Mar Environmental Sciences have a tremendous number of hands-on opportunities to, to learn what they, to apply what they learn in the classroom. So from theory to practice, and one of the main ways that we do this in our college is to allow undergraduates the opportunity for research. Uh, undergraduate students work side by side with faculty on applied research projects solving real world problems that our industry and agency partners come to us to solve for them. We have a robust undergraduate research program in the summer. Many of our students graduate with research that's published in professional scientific journals. And some have even been named on patent applications. Um, I wanted to give you a, a list of some recent student projects. Uh, that have happened over the last year in our college. Fungicide resistance in grapevine powdery mildew, price indicators for Cal Poly's bull test, an analysis of the effect of grapefruit size on wine quality, the effects of urban sprawl on farmland prices, building an aquaponics system, restoration of a mountain meadow in the Sierras, building a mechanized lettuce harvester, reducing wildfires near towns, and many, many more. And all these are done by our undergraduates in close partnership with our awesome faculty. If you haven't already, I encourage you to follow us on social media and stay connected with the college. Our website, cafes.calpoly.edu, also hosts information and will have the recordings from this and all the departmental Zoom sessions. You can also sign up for a virtual tour and chat with our college ambassadors. Check out our website for that information. We've also posted some fun graphics on our social media for you to grab and post on your own channels. Go Mustangs! The bookstore is also offering a discount on Mustang gear, so be sure to check to shop online. Okay, now I'd like to introduce you to some of our other speakers who will ask to participate in a panel discussion. Please, uh, for panelists, please introduce yourselves uh, with your year, major, hometown, or position here at Cal Poly. Uh, and I'm going to ask them to go ahead and introduce themselves, and we'll start with Dr. Lambert. Hi, my name is Dr. Amy Lambert, and I am an assist or associate professor in the Department of Food Science and Nutrition. I teach on the food science side of the department. And I am also a mom of a current Cal Poly freshman. Good morning, everyone. My name is Diane Korth, and I'm one of the academic advisors for the college. I also coordinate the Multicultural Agriculture Program. And in our college, we have what we consider the shared model of advising. What this means is there are professional advisors who work with students. We are connected 
by department. So we work closely with department heads and faculty and know the curriculum very well for the majors that we work with. We also hire students to serve as peer advisors to assist our current Cal Poly students with um, very general questions or to give them their student their own personal perspective of their degree and what has assisted them to be successful and then we connect with faculty as well we have faculty advisors who assist students and i'd say primarily with you know understanding um, the career opportunities these are faculty who are experts in their field and can really guide students through the process and help them be successful as well thank you Cassie? Good morning, everyone. My name is Cassie Scatina. I'm from Smith Valley, Nevada, and currently I'm a third year pre-vet animal science major and currently the student manager of our Cal Poly Equine Unit. Kendra? Hi, everyone. My name is Kendra Fulton. I'm a third year experience industry management student from Salinas, California. And Julia? Hi, my name is Julia Hazami. I am a second year environmental management and protection major, and I'm from the Los Angeles area. Great. Thanks to you all for participating from your homes. Let's get started with some questions. First question is, what kind of resources made the transition uh, to college easier? We can start with Julia. Yeah, so I would say one of the biggest resources that helped me was the DRC, which is the Disabilities Resource Center. And that is a group on campus that helps with people with disabilities that range from physical to learning. Um, and the reason they were helpful is because they ensured me that my specific needs were important and that they would support me in whatever way possible to make my transition easier and as successful as possible. Um, and then also the RA um, or the residential advisor was very helpful because it was nice to have someone to talk to who had been in your shoes previously and could support you in whatever way. Thank you. Kendra? So kind of going off what Julia said, um, looking for that help from, you know, programs that Cal Poly provides. So for me, my freshman year, uh, my peer advisor was so helpful to me, um, as, re as well as the rest of the advising team. So I would definitely say don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. Everybody at Cal Poly wants you to succeed. Um, I also utilize the online degree planner. So I was able to really visually see what classes I was going to be taking every quarter and see how it would all come together uh, during my four years at Cal Poly. Great, and Cassie? So I really utilized my academic and peer advisor as well. Even as a third year to this day, I still go to my academic advisor. I'm constantly asking for just any general advice, any questions, um, especially as I am gearing towards applying to vet school. And I believe that as a freshman, one of my favorite parts about an, being an incoming student was our week of welcome. Wow. Um, we really just got to connect with our advisors. We got introduced to several different clubs. And so through that, I really just got to make connections through people who are now my good friends and faculty members as well. I'm happy to hear the students mention advising. So good for you. And I'd say for the transition, you know, it really depends on each individual student. Some may struggle a little academically or in the social emotional area and some it's smooth sailing and from the time they set foot on campus. So we have resources available for everyone. There's a writing and learning center that provides tutoring. There are supplemental workshops and challenging courses in um, the sciences and math area. We have a health and counseling center cross-cultural center. And in the college, we have the multicultural agriculture program, which really provides a networking opportunity for students to create a sense of belonging. We have peer mentors who are available as well. And it's just an environment where students can be comfortable and um, get connected with some of their peers. Thanks, Diane. Uh, another question is, what resources does Cal Poly have to assist with career development? Maybe we can start with Dr. Lambert talking about the faculty connections. Thank you. Sorry about that. I think the best way to get engaged in getting your career development kicked off is to start engaging with your professors early on. Your faculty are the ones teaching your classes. You're not getting TAs. You're having the faculty in the lectures and in the labs. And starting to build that faculty-student relationship is very important. 
we bring guest speakers to class, whether we bring them virtually or face-to-face -face in person, and getting and engaging with those individuals and honing what specifically you wanna do with your career is a very vital piece, as well as getting involved with some of the student clubs and uh, competition teams as well, where you actually get to go out into meetings, professional meetings, and start building the networks on your own without necessarily the faculty involvement. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cavalletto, Career Services? Yes, the campus has a, a robust Career Services Center here on campus that helps students to connect with, not only as they approach graduation to identify employers for full-time employment, but also to uh, identify potential employers for internships. The internship process here at Cal Poly allows students during their uh, quarter breaks to uh, work employment in, the, in their chosen industries to learn more about them and discover what they like and dislike about the, the opportunities that are before them. Several of our departments actually hold career fairs as well, so it allows students to connect with the employers that are directly related with their disciplines. The Career Services offers a campus career fair every quarter here on campus where uh, hundreds of uh, employers are here for three days to uh, meet and uh, interview Cal Poly students. I, I would just as Dean in, in watching our faculty and our staff and the interaction with our students, I would just say that, that uh, the faculty are so key to helping students um, develop their uh, connectivity with industry and develop their, their network because uh, the bigger that network is, the better opportunity you'll get a, your, your full-time job by the time you're into your junior year and beginning of your senior year. Uh, many of our students already have their, their career position. So um, it's that connectedness that, uh, that the faculty and the interactions the faculty and the staff provide. Um, let's, let's jump over to housing. Uh, what's housing like on campus? And uh, how do you get comfortable living on campus? And a final question is, is there housing available for all four years? Let's start with Cassie. Yeah, so I have lived on campus all three years at Cal Poly. Um, my freshman year, I lived in the red brick dorms and Santa Lucia is our freshman dorm that's centered around CAFE's majors, which I absolutely loved because as I found it was you know, hard to transition into my classes and a lot of the people that were in my same major, same classes, we could study together really easily. So I found that very beneficial as a freshman living in that dorm. And um, ever since then, I've lived in the apartments on campus, which I've just found really convenient to walk to the equine center at work, to walk to my classes, and I could go back and forth in between, not having to worry about driving. Um, so that was really convenient. And also last summer, I lived in what we call call ag housing and a lot of our different animal science and plant science units on campus offer housing to employees who work at our units on campus and so they the housing is on the unit specifically so they have really easy access to work and each month you take 20 hours out of your paycheck which goes to your housing so housing ends up being at a very reduced cost compared to the normal rent on campus so um, that was very beneficial and I absolutely loved it and it was very convenient so Great. Julia. Hi. So um, in all honesty, the transition from living at home to on campus can be a little intimidating because you have all these new responsibilities and it can get overwhelming. But I also think that you find a new sense of independence from living on your own. And in regard to making it more comfortable, the biggest piece of advice I could say is the student has to be the one to take initiative. Um, I personally didn't have the best living situation my freshman year. And so I ended up moving dorms. And at first I wasn't sure if this was the right decision for me or if it would make my living situation any better. But in the end, I'm so happy that I did that. And the reason I'm sharing this information is because I want all incoming freshmen to know that not all living situations end up being the best, but there's always something you can do to make your situation better for yourself. You just have to take that initiative. Great, Kendra? So my freshman year uh, on-campus living situation was a little bit different than Cassidy and Julia's. Um, I actually lived in the on-campus apartments my freshman year. Um, so this housing gave us a little bit more freedom with cooking and we had that extra space, that extra living space. We didn't have to share a bathroom with so many um, people. So it was definitely a nice transition um, from living at home. 
So I would say the difference between the apartments and the dorms is that in the apartments, you really have to uh, go out of your way to meet people compared to in the dorms when you're in, you know, those closer quarters all the time. So this was like a little intimidating at first, uh, but I just had to remind myself that everybody was in the same boat trying to make friends and feel comfortable in our new um, housing and college environment. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, Dr. Cavalletto. Um, Cal Poly's had for a number of years a requirement for students, our incoming freshmen, to live on campus. Uh, our experience and the, the experience of other institutions across the country has been that students that live on campus are more successful. They uh, have minimized the distractions, they're close to their classes, many of their day-to-day -day needs can be, be fulfilled more, uh, more easily. So we've uh, put that requirement in place. And as I said, it's been in place for a number of years. Starting this fall, incoming freshmen for the, our college, the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences, and the College of Architecture and Environmental Design, students will be required to live their first two years on campus. And uh, over the next couple of years, the, the remainder of the colleges will also have their students being on campus for two years. Again, the data shows that students that live on campus do better generally. Uh, they're able to make better connections and, and uh, integrate more socially into the environment, but also have easier access to uh, resources that they need for their academic programs. There is the ability for those that uh, have exceptions for that. So uh, as you apply for housing, be sure to look for um, that in the, in the housing portal. Thank you, Dr. Cavalletto. Um, let's jump to the laboratories and, and maybe we can have the students talk a little bit about one of your labs or enterprise classes. How did it help you to learn and to, uh, uh, what, and also what did you like about it? So if we could start with the students. Yeah, so honestly, when people ask me why I chose Cal Poly or what's my favorite part about Cal Poly, it's these enterprise courses. And if I could, I would take a whole year, a whole quarter of just enterprise classes because they've just been so fun. They're basically what an enterprise is. It's all hands on and it just um, completely abides by Cal Poly's learn by doing philosophy, which is I'm a very visual learner. I learn best and I actually can be able to do it and see what I'm doing. And I think I've taken about maybe seven or eight enterprises since I've been at Cal Poly, but um, there's animal science enterprises as well as those involved with plant science majors as well. Um, the different animal science one, for instance, I was last quarter, I was involved in the foaling and equine breeding enterprise. And we actually, the students get to physically be here at night at the Cal Poly foaling barn and help the mayor full out her baby and then in the breeding enterprise we got to breed those mares back and watch them get pregnant so they can have foals next year and it's just it's just been such a rewarding experience and i've learned so much and i just don't really think there's any other college that can compare to these programs that we have where students are doing all of the work on campus everything at every unit is student run student managed and it's just been very rewarding of how successful we have been great thank you cassie one of the labs that I really enjoyed was my GIS class, which is Geographic Information System, which essentially is just map making. And um, before taking this class, I wasn't really sure what like, goes into map making, but coming out of it, I realized that there are so many things that we use on a daily basis, whether it's an actual map or the GPS on our phone. And there's so many things that go into those, um, those tools, the work and the time that go into it. And it opened my eyes to realize like, what am I actually using and how did that get to where it became? Um, and then what I like about my labs is that it's comprised of all of my best friends within my major. And that's actually something I love about Cal Poly is that you become so close to the people within your major and you get to be able to go to class with them, go to labs. Um, and then lastly, my professor, Marisa Fitzgibbon was just an incredible teacher. And I like, she deserves the best because she's just been, always there for her students, always ensuring that we're learning if we have any questions and just walking with us to make sure that we are doing the best we can and as successful as possible. Thank you, Julia. Um, Kendra? So my major experience industry management, also known as EIM, is basically it just encompasses the entire event, hospitality, 
tourism, um, recreation, sport management industry, all under one umbrella. So our, or our labs um, look a little bit different than the uh, labs that Cassidy and Julia talked about. So in our labs, we work a lot on our leadership skills. We design events and experiences. We conduct team building workshops and even host guest speakers from different programs throughout Cal Poly. So the learn by doing motto is absolutely still apparent in our labs, just I would say in a little bit more of a unique way than a traditional lab. Great, thank you. Uh, is it possible to change majors or add a minor? Diane, maybe you can- it is absolutely possible to change majors at Cal Poly. However, it is a process. So the way we start out is um, incoming freshmen and transfer students cannot start the change major process until their second quarter. We want to give you the opportunity to get to know your current major a little and you might find that it's actually the best place for you and also some time to do research. Um, the Mustang Success Center, which is our university freshman focus advising center, um, it provides workshops for students starting in the summer and then also in the fall and they're available to all students across campus incoming and continuing students. So they provide workshops to give you information on the process and also they connect with career services so students can do research on career opportunities for different majors that they're interested in. And then students, they're beginning their second quarter can start what's called an individualized change of major agreement in ICMA. And this is usually set up for one or two quarters and students need to complete three courses um, that go toward their target major, earn a certain grade in those courses and have a particular GPA. So for instance, if it's a highly impacted major, maybe you will need a 3.0 GPA in order to get into that major for those courses or overall. And if it's a, um, a major that maybe has a little more flexibility, then it could be a lower GPA requirement. So those are things that students should really um, visit and look into, talk to an advisor about during their first quarter. Okay, Julia. Did you talk about adding a minor? Yeah, so um, as I said before, I'm an environmental management and protection major, but I've also always had a pretty strong interest in psychology. So rather than changing my majors, I decided to declare the minor in psych, and that has allowed me to take um, two, like to take these, um, or to have these two fields of study and be able to take classes from them both while still pursuing the major in environmental management. Great. Thank you, Julie. Um, what kind of resources are available for transfer students? We'll start with Dr. Cavalletto. Uh, transfer students are an important component of our student population here at Cal Poly. Uh, you'll find that uh, many of our faculty uh, were transfer students as well. So they understand uh, the special needs that transfer students have as they come in, they're getting closer to graduation, they're more focused on their careers and their uh, looking for those networking opportunities and connections to to be ready within a couple of years to graduate and to enter into industry. So our faculty are a first resource. Secondly, the campus has a transfer center that's uh, been established here to help transfer students to feel a place of home, to be able to connect uh, with other transfer students here on campus and to talk about the, the unique challenges and, and opportunities that transfer students have as they um, switch institutions in the middle of their, their career focus here. Thank you, Diane? Sure, I'd like to add, of course, um, advising is critical for transfer students. Since you're coming in from a um, community college or another in, um, university, we really want to start early and look at your academic plan and lay everything out so that you can complete your degree in the two or, two or three year period, depending on your degree. So we start out in the summer with transfer slow days, which is an orientation for transfer student, always occurs in August. And we help you review your curriculum so you know where you stand with your degree. And also we help you register for classes for fall quarter. So you set out knowing exactly what you need to take for your first quarter at Cal Poly. Um, I'd also, again, want to mention the Multicultural Agriculture Program, because this center really seems to serve as a hub for a lot of our transfer students. Um, 
some of our transfer students are commuting. So in the center, we have a refrigerator, a microwave. Like I said, there's good social connection. We have other students there who serve as peer mentors. And sometimes it's a, just a great place for our transfer students to connect. University-wide in October, we participate in National Transfer Week. So there'll be a lot of events focus that week on transfer students across campus so that you can get to know each other a little better and share your experiences. Thank you, Diane. Maybe, Diane, you could take this to start with. Is it difficult to register or get into classes at Cal Poly? Very popular question. So registration, like everything else, is a learning process. Students need to learn how to use our tools in order to register and also need to understand their curriculum and when they should be taking classes. So one great thing in this college, many great things, but one of them is we have orientation classes for the majority of our majors and students take that class their first quarter. So within that class, you get to learn about tools like registration and also your degree and how to map it out. It was mentioned earlier by one of the students, we have um, degree planner, which assists students with their academic plan. And it's kind of like a roadmap for them. For freshmen, you receive a block schedule your first quarter for fall. So you will be registered in at least 12 units, if not more. And then the subsequent quarters, winter and spring, you get a full or a partial. It depends on, of course, the classes you've brought in through um, maybe AP credit, advanced placement credit, or any community college classes as well. And I'd say the biggest thing for students um, regarding classes is learning to be flexible. So a lot of times students have a plan in their mind for the following quarter of what they wanna take and when, but we have classes that begin at 7 a.m. and our last class ends at 10 p.m. So we almost always can find a full load of classes for students, but they have to be flexible and realistic about the days and times that they wanna take the classes. And peer advisors are a great resource, the Mustang Success Center for freshmen to help students with their registration each quarter. Thanks, Diane. Cassie, would you uh, make comments? Yeah, um, I personally haven't had a problem with having to find my classes or registering. I've only ever been waitlisted for a class once. Maybe I'm just really lucky, but um, I use the degree planner as Diane was talking about. And in that you can make several sample schedules and you can kind of see, you have a specific registration time for your classes. And um, as you get closer to your date, you can see the number of seats in the class. And so you can change that around to your availability. And um, I have also gone to my academic advisor for that as well to get advice on what classes I should take. And for each major, there's a flow chart and a curriculum sheet. And I learned with the flow chart that it just kind of gives you a suggestion of what classes you should take each quarter and each year for your major. And you honestly do not have to follow that um, quarter by quarter. You can go out of order and I found that to be really helpful just as long as you meet the prerequisites. Um, I took classes that I should have, you know, waited to take my senior year as a sophomore and vice versa. There's classes that I still need to take that um, I just found it was easier to push off. So you can do it um, in any order that you like as, as long as you meet the prerequisites and it, the schedules are pretty flexible to meet your schedule as well. So I personally haven't had any issues for it. And if you have any questions, go to your academic advisor. They're the best resource for that. Thanks, Cassie. Um, the next question is what kind of opportunities are there for students to be involved in campus outside of the classroom? And Julia, could you start us off with that, please? Yeah, of course. So this year I have been involved in ASI student government and I hold a position on the board of directors representing my college. So in the vaguest terms, as a board member, um, <clears throat> we represent the student population and basically act as a liaison between the student body and Cal Poly Corporation or other staff members. And as a board member, you're able to write and pass bills, resolutions and endorsements about issues that are important to the students. So for example, we um, recently passed a resolution calling for Cal Poly and ASI to transition to 100% recycled paper and a paper reduction campaign. So then basically after these bills, resolutions or endorsements are passed by the board, um, which is comprised of all students, 
It then can go to the Academic Senate, which is comprised of all faculty members, and then it goes there for further discussion and a final vote. But I would probably say the best part about being on student government is being surrounded by the most determined and dedicated hardworking students and just being able to see everyone's work really be paying off in the end. So it's been a great experience and I want to change it for the world. Great. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Cassidy. Yeah, so these past few years, I've been involved in our CAFE's Ambassadors Program, as well as I've been working a lot on our Cal Poly Equine Unit. Um, so with our CAFE's Ambassador, basically you're a representative and a face of our CAFE's College. And through that, um, we give tours to all of our animal science units in our agriculture department. Um, we get to go to several different conferences. I was able to attend the California State FFA Conference. Um, we've sent students to the Tulare Farm Show, um, and we've hosted our own conferences with several different colleges around the state of California. And it's just been a great opportunity to get to speak to prospective students and meet a lot of um, different people as well. We have guest speakers every week in meetings. So uh, that's been one of my favorite opportunities at Cal Poly. And um, I started working at the equine unit last summer. And through that, I've made a, a lot of connections as well. I've gotten animal science hours for my prereqs for vet school. And at Cal Poly, we offer a lot of enterprises and classes that you can uh, take as well. And the best part about that is you don't have to be an animal science major. You don't have to even be under the CAFES college. You can be any major and take um, any of our writing classes, starting from our beginning writing with little to no experience at all to our advanced cult starting class. And then we have several different enterprises, as I mentioned earlier as well, like um, foaling, halter breaking, um, breeding, and several more. So I've been very involved with the equine unit and that's been one of my favorite opportunities at Cal Poly. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, Kendra, could you add to that, please? Okay, so I would say I've got involved um, outside the classroom in so many different ways. Um, there's too many to name, but two highlights for me uh, would be our annual fundraising event that we put on for the EIM department, as well as the annual Poly Royal Rodeo, which is actually the largest collegiate rodeo in the nation. Um, so a little bit about what I do with the EIM auction and dinner fundraiser. This is a completely student run event and it's open to, you don't have to be an EIM major to participate and help plan it. Uh, we basically raise money for our department at this event that goes directly towards sending uh, students to conferences, funding research and numerous other things. Um, this event is also a great networking opportunity. So uh, the EIM department specifically has really close connections with our industry leaders. So we have industry leaders from companies like George P. Johnson, Adobe, and Visit California come to this event. So it's an awesome opportunity for students like me um, to meet industry leaders and that could potentially you know, lead to a job. And so last year I served as the lead for this event and I really got to see what I was learning in my EIM classes come to life at this event. Uh, and the same goes for Poly Royal Rodeo. I lo have loved getting to see my passion for the sport of rodeo and my passion for event planning coming together. Uh, once again, I've had the opportunity to work with some of the biggest companies in the rodeo industry as the event lead for Poly Royal Rodeo. And so I would say that getting involved out of the classroom is probably the best thing you can do for yourself at Cal Poly, especially within cafes, because there's numerous, like endless amount of opportunities. Um, and getting involved with these opportunities can lead to things like jobs. Uh, so for me, uh, working on the Poly Royal Rodeo production team uh, gave me the opportunity to now work in the cafe's dean's office, which has been uh, fantastic. So definitely take advantage of all the opportunities you can. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, Dr. Prince, how about the research for undergraduates? There are many research opportunities for undergraduates in cafes. Um, typically, it would start with a student connecting with a faculty member in class and being interested in a topic, taking the theory they learn in class and applying it in a research project. And um, if things go well, there, there are also funded research projects, and we have many students that are hired on 
external grant funds to work in professors' labs and in the field and out in the mountains and the woods. We have a very strong summer undergraduate research program that over the last couple of years has matched 100 undergraduates up with our faculty for um, half-time research during the summer. So these, these have provided excellent uh, ways for students to apply what they've learned in our class to connect with industry and agency leaders and also, as Kendra hinted, really position them well for the job market. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cavalletto, you have anything to add? Sure. We have uh, about 30 uh, clubs within the college. And so we have many students that participate in club activities. Many of these clubs are either associated with a specific discipline or they're more general in nature. And so there's a lot of activity that goes around that. We have a, a student council that uh, pulls all these clubs together and helps uh, coordinate activities and helps uh, support the, the clubs as they uh, participate uh, throughout the year. We have a number of competitive teams that uh, in each of the, the departments as well. So they, these teams often compete against other universities in national competitions. Uh, Cal Poly does quite well typically in, in these competitions. The students have mentioned about enterprise projects where they're able to put into practice many of the things that they're learning in the classroom. And as they're doing these enterprise projects, they're also earning academic credit for them. And then we employ a large number, more than 100 students uh, from the college are employed at our academic units. And so they're able to help uh, put into practice a bunch of what they do in helping to support our, our dairy, our meat processing center, our crops unit, our horticulture unit, our uh, food science, uh, nutrition uh, pilot plant. So lots of opportunities and ways to uh, be engaged outside of the classroom. Great. Well, the next question is one that's very popular among parents. How realistic is it to graduate in four years? And we'll start with Kendra. Yeah, so I know coming into Cal Poly, I personally was like, I believe that like you couldn't graduate in four years and my parents were like freaking out too, but it's definitely realistic. Um, I'm actually on track to graduate a quarter early and I didn't come to Cal Poly with any AP credits or existing college courses. Um, I have taken an average of 16 to 21 units a quarter, which comes out to four or five classes and uh, students are required to take 12 units a quarter to be a full-time student. Um, I did take some summer classes to just like boost myself ahead and give myself a little bit of um, like leeway with like my quarters. So if I wanted to have a more relaxed spring quarter because I was taking some more advanced classes, I could definitely do that uh, because I took a couple classes in the summer. Um, but it definitely is realistic to graduate in four years if you hold yourself to it. And then of course, seek the guidance uh, when you need it. Thank you. Julia, do you have something to add? Um, the only thing, because Kendra kind of touched upon it, um, but I would definitely suggest that the students take advantage of CAFE's peer advising. I go there every quarter to make sure I'm on track with my degree progress and to make sure I'm not falling behind. But um, I would also like to say that, same with Kendra, I took some summer classes. And I think that can be really helpful, especially if you either want to get ahead or you want to give yourself some more breathing space throughout your quarters at Cal Poly. But as long as you hold yourself accountable, I think it's very realistic. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm going to graduate for, or, um, in four years. So I think that anyone can do it if they hold themselves accountable. Thank you, Julia. Uh, and Cassie? Yeah, um, to ditto to both what Kendra and Julia said. I've also taken classes over the summer, just one class. Um, and it's, you know, it's given me a little bit of a break throughout the quarters during the school year, but it's totally optional. You don't have to do it. And um, coming from as a pre-vet major, you know, and I can vouch for those who are also trying to apply to grad schools right now, um, even outside of your major courses that you're required to take, there's a lot of prerequisites that might not fall within the classes you need to take that are required for your degree. And um, I've still managed to be able to fit in all of my courses needed for my degree, as well as the additional prereqs that I've had to tack on, tack 
on along with those. And I've been able to take enterprise courses and fun classes that I've just wanted to take for my own personal enjoyment as well. So it's definitely doable. Um, I've take I've and on average I've taken about 16 units per quarter just to make that happen um, along with enterprises. So it's definitely doable and it's not really that challenging to graduate in four years. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Um, how, how to study abroad work. Uh, Julia, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, so I was planning on studying abroad and I was accepted to do it in the fall. But um, given the circumstances, I've decided to withdraw my application and go a different quarter. But after going about the process, there are definitely some tips that I can give that I've learned. Um, the first is it's um, a good idea to save three to four GEs for your trip abroad um, because those are the easiest ones to do unless you're going on a program that is specific um, to your college or department. Um, but it's also really important that you're communicating with your academic and study abroad advisors so they can help you figure out any academic or financial barriers that restrict you from going because going abroad is definitely something um, that everyone should take advantage of if they can because it's important to gain that experience of living in a different country and learning different ways of life. But um, you have to make sure you are communicating with people from various ends to make sure that whatever you want to do um, can make it um, is able to happen. Great. Thank you. Um, can you take classes outside your major? Diane, you want to start us off? Sure. So all students will have general education courses they need to complete. This is the area where you really, there's breadth and depth across the university where you will um, take courses in different areas. Even transfer students, you will have three upper division general education classes for your degree. Um, curricula um, varies across the college. So in some majors, you will have an area of free electives where you can take anything at the university to fulfill those units. For other majors, you have concentrations or approved electives where you have a variety of classes that you can choose from to fulfill those requirements. So, and it really depends also on career go goals. So for instance, if you're an animal science student who's planning to go to vet school, your additional courses in um, outside of this college would probably be a lot of biology and chemistry, maybe some physics in order to prepare you for your transfer. So it does vary some. We also have about 88 majors, excuse me, 88 minors at Cal Poly and, and Julia touched on this, but minors are available to students. Some it's just truly on their interests. Let's say you're a um, bioresource and ag engineering student, but you were always, you've grown up playing a musical instrument and you want to do a, a music minor, you can do that if that's something that you want to fit in. Or students also choose minors to, <clears throat> excuse me, enhance their degree and assist them on um, their career track and give them kind of a, an extra um, advantage to some other students. Okay, thank you, Diane. Uh, any of the students, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, so I can touch on that a little bit. Uh, like Dan was talking about, we have a list of required electives, uh, some majors, and that is true for EIM. So I've actually taken military science classes that are centered around leadership. I've taken a handful of business classes um, at the business school, uh, such as uh, business law, accounting, corporate communications. Uh, I would say that these are a great way to uh, venture out to other colleges and learn about fields outside of your degree that can actually like come full circle and be helpful in your chosen field of interest. And they're definitely some of my favorite classes and a great way to meet uh, people outside of cafes. Great. Thanks, Kendra. Um, okay, we'll move on. Um, are there research opportunities for the students? Dr. Prince. Yeah, I, I think I've touched on them a couple times already, but there are research opportunities, both formal and informal. And uh, you can um, find them through your faculty members in direct contact. You can go right now on your department websites and every faculty member has a web page that talks about um, what his or her research interests are. You could reach out to them right now if you want, even before you start, just to just to let them know you're interested and perhaps they can refer you to some material that you can read and see if you really are interested in what they're doing. 
We have paid and unpaid opportunities. We have our summer undergraduate research program. I, I think that if, if you're a student in cafes and you want to do some hands-on research, we can accommodate you. Thank and I think I probably Amy would be a good one to respond to this. Dr. Lambert is a, supervises a whole lot of students in a pretty exciting research program. Hello, everyone. Um, the exciting research program that I do is I'm in the field of sensory evaluation of food, sensory and consumer insight. And when a company goes to market with a new product, they need to get feedback from the consumer. So at the end of the day, it's not what the company wants, but the company wants what the consumer wants because they ultimately want to sell their product. So I do a lot of corporate testing for companies to help give them feedback outside of their facility. And so I employ a large number of students to help me with this task. So they get involved in the setup and the design of the testing we do, the setup of the questionnaires that we're going to ask and the actual testing and all the detailed control. They help recruit the subjects that will be in the test. They will execute it. They will help analyze the data and build the presentations that we have to give to the company. In addition to that, I do a lot of research on sensory evaluation. So I have students that help with corporate projects, but I also have students that help me with my research projects. And it's a little bit more theoretical and fundamental sensory science and base, but the two link very well. Great. Thank you. And Kendra, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, so from a student perspective, um, last summer I participated in the Summer Undergraduate Research Program, uh, also known as SERP, that Dean Prince has mentioned multiple times. Um, I applied for a specific project that I was super interested in, and basically in short, it was all about how the agriculture industry utilizes trade shows for marketing. So once again, I got to see my passions for agriculture and event planning come together. Uh, so over the majority of summer, I designed a survey, sent it out to my target audience, analyzed my data, and developed an entire 30-plus page report all about it. Um, this was a great opportunity to develop academically and professionally and a great resume builder as well. And I'm super excited because I've actually been given the opportunity to expand on this research that I did last summer and turn it into my senior project. So I definitely recommend getting involved in research within cafes. Great, thanks Kendra. Okay, now I'd like to take questions from the audience. Uh, please use the Q&A function. We'll answer as many as possible. Great, and we had a number of questions about how scheduling works for first time freshmen. So Diane, maybe you could take a crack at that. Sure, and I'm assuming we're talking about their um, course schedules. So. As um, I mentioned earlier, freshmen are given a block schedule, fall, winter, and spring quarter their first year. And fall quarter is a full schedule of at least 12 units. And those are based on a track that's been carefully decided by um, your faculty and department head and the advisors involved in that also. And it's to get you started for classes then to carry on um, the following quarters. And if you're in a major that has, you know, classes you build on like a chemistry series or a calculus series, then you're placed in that first class um, in that quarter. And then winter and spring is also continuing on, we've mentioned the roadmap or degree planner, there'll be courses you'll, you'll be automatically enrolled in. Sometimes for your major, it's not the full 12 units winter and spring. It may just be one or two classes. And a lot of it depends on what the student has already brought in to the university. So hopefully that answers your question. The Mustang Success Center is really gonna be focusing on freshman advising for your first year. So they're a great place. You could send an email. Um, and connect with them and they can answer a lot of your general questions or also sending an email to cafes advising. And we had a few follow ups to that as far as what are the options for taking summer school and does that help you fulfill some of your GE requirements. 
Okay, I'll try this again. So for summer, um, yeah, we have different programs. There's a um, quarter plus program and there are um, summer classes available at Cal Poly. That list is being worked on right now, actually. And those, so students will be receiving information. Um, sometimes students choose to go to a community college and take classes that way, and that's an option as well. The thing is really understanding um, what class to take in order to fulfill the requirements for your particular curriculum. Because for some majors, we have support classes where maybe um, you're taking an econ class, an economics class to fulfill a GE, but you need to take a specific economics class for your major. So those are things you have to really um, be mindful of before registering in summer classes. We also have a few questions about the honors program in the college. Dr. Cavalletto, could you address that? Yeah, so the university uh, hosts an honors program. Um, some students were uh, asked to participate in that based upon their uh, grades and test scores. And so students that were asked to to or invited to participate, you can uh, do that. It allows you, the honors program connects you with students within that group. There's some additional courses and things that are accessible to you through the honors program. And it, there's some uh, unique uh, projects and uh, team building exercises and things that happen through that program. Students that aren't initially selected, but uh, would like to, um, can't, once they're here on campus, they can reach out to the honors program and uh, ask to apply through an alternate route um, after you've been here for a year. We had a few questions about admission to vet school. Dean Thulin, could you address the path that students take and what the acceptance rate to UC Davis typically is? Uh, I'm not sure the acceptance rate, although we would be, Cal Poly would be considered one of the top feeder schools or vet schools in this country. Uh, anywhere from 45 to 60 students a year going into various veterinary medical um, programs across the country. A lot go to UC Davis, but also Colorado State, Texas A&M, Cornell. And then we have a number of students that are selected while they're at Cal Poly uh, to, um, uh, to actually participate in vet school uh, in the uh, UK. So um, University of Glasgow, University of Edinburgh, and also uh, the Royal Veterinary College in London. Uh, we have partnerships with all three of those universities. Um, I want to come back to what Cassidy mentioned. Um, you know, it's all about doing the prereqs and getting, you know, good scores and then getting the experience, um, you know, as a student, as an undergraduate student. And I think that's what separates Cal Poly from so many universities. We have some very, very nice facilities uh, that our industry and government partners and donors have helped us to, uh, to achieve. So when you have good facilities, you, um, the students are able to actually run those operations and get experience that they would never get in vet school or, um, uh, or, or other universities that send students to their own vet schools. Um, we also have partnerships with uh, uh, other veterinary, private veterinary schools where they'll come and uh, work uh, you know, bring their veterinary medical school students from their campuses to Cal Poly for a week at a time to get experience that our undergraduates get. Um, so it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing process and, and something we're well known for. And uh, maybe I'll let Cassidy um, make a comment, but there's a lot of interest in the animal science, a lot of those students. And I can't remember how many, but maybe Cassidy, you could make a comment or two. Yeah, um, I'd just like to add on to what you said. We're going to talk about it more in our animal science department Zoom meeting. So if you join that afterwards, we'll have a lot more information on that. But Davis, their acceptance rates, I'm not sure the exact percentage from Cal Poly, but I do know they accept the most Cal Poly students. That's just how it's worked out in the past few years. And it's been an ongoing trend that um, I believe we sent like eight or nine students from Cal Poly to Davis last year. And um, because Davis is also in the state of California and a lot of our, it's close to home for a lot of our Cal Poly students, um, Cal Poly has really organized our curriculum sheet and our flow chart to match the prerequisite requirements for Davis. So 
actually, if you, if you want to go to, to Davis, you don't need to take any extra courses that don't match up with the courses you already have to take to get your bachelor's degree in animal science. So that is the one nice thing about applying to Davis. But um, if you wanted to apply to any other schools, um, most of them require extra prerequisites, but not for Davis. Thank you, Cassidy. And here's a question for the students. How do you balance your academics and your social life? Julia, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I would say that in regard to that, I think it's all a learning experience because you've never lived away from home. You've never not had someone to kind of always kind of push you to either do more academic stuff or more social stuff. And now you're kind of all on your own. So it's a weird feeling, but you learn how to manage that. And a lot of it is accountability. You have to hold yourself accountable for realizing, okay, um, I actually need to study for this class rather than going and hanging out with my friends. But I mean, at the same time, you have to realize that after doing so much hard work, you deserve to have a little bit more of a social life, but it all is balance and learning how to manage that balance and just kind of going with the flow. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but like figuring it out as you go, because nothing's going to come um, and be perfect. All of a sudden you have to realize that things are going to change and, but I'll figure it out. So that's kind of what I've done. I've just kind of learned to like figure it out as I go. Haley, I'd like to add to this. Um, when students uh, arrive on campus, they'll see a, um, a slogan put out there, 25 to 35 hours per week. And so the average student spends uh, 12 to 16 hours, 17 hours a week in the classroom, but then they should plan on spending an additional 25 to 35 hours uh, outside of the classroom to do their readings, do their homework, complete labs, uh, finish all those pieces together. So going to school is really like a job. It's a, a 40 to 50 hour a week job. And then once you've done that work, then you can have time outside of that to, to be involved in other uh, social activities. Great, we have a few questions about Swanton Pacific Ranch and if students take classes there or internships or both. Dean Thulin, would you like to answer? Yeah, um, we're very privileged to have a Swanton, our Swanton Pacific uh, Ranch uh, up in just north of uh, Santa Cruz uh, in the Davenport area. We own property about 3,800 acres all the way down to the ocean um, on both sides of Highway 1. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ranch that was donated to us by Al Smith, who started the uh, Orchard Supply Hardware Company. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful place to go and learn um, and sort of get outside of the box, outside of your major. Uh, we have a, a very large redwood forest there. We have organic uh, vegetable production. Uh, we have uh, organic fruit production with apple trees. Uh, we have cattle, um, the forestry, the hydrology. Um, it, it's all, it all comes together. So we have students that go there on internships. We have students that will go there and spend, uh, you know, a quarter uh, just helping with one of the research projects or just the normal day-to-day um, -day operations. Um, and they do have classes. We do have, this summer we'll have a class uh, on the forestry side uh, that will, is very impactful. It's our uh, uh, a capstone class uh, for students. And we have a lot of the um, federal and the state uh, government officials that are involved with forestry and natural resources come and speak to the students. And so it's, it's a huge opportunity. And it's, it's a place where if you don't know what you want to do and yet you like the outdoors and you like these various areas, um, it's a place where you can go for a quarter and do an internship or get involved with one of the enterprise classes, such as the stalker cattle project where they'll go up and the students will actually run, you know, 400 head of uh, stalker calves uh, on the weekends. They'll go up and dr sometimes during the week. Uh, with their classes. So it's a, it's a place where you can go and learn and, and it's pretty safe and it's just, it's just a beautiful environment overlooking just north of Santa Cruz. If anyone else would like to comment, uh, any of the students, have you had a chance to be involved yet? Let me just add, uh, Dean Thulin, that um, a number of departments uh, take field trips up to the uh, Swamp Pacific Ranch during the year as well. There's over 200 field trips each year there where students will go up for one or multiple days to 
to be involved either in the forestry side, the crop production, the, the livestock, or the environmental sciences uh, part of it. So lots of opportunities there. Julia, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was going to say that um, my GIS professor, Marisa Fitzgibbon, she took us on a voluntary field trip there this quarter or last quarter. And we didn't go with a, an intention of doing any um, specific um, to our class, but we got to go and hike around. And it was just, I, that was my first time going to Swan Ranch. And it was one of the most incredible, breathtaking and calming environments. So I would definitely advise all students, if you have the opportunity to go there, whether it be on one day or for a quarter or for the summer, to definitely take advantage of it. And, and while, the, while the ranch is organized and, and managed by the College of Agriculture, Food and Environmental Sciences, it serves the entire campus and many, many majors and, and the, all the colleges. And in addition to that, we also have other universities from across the country that do come in with students uh, for a week at a time or a few days at a time just to use that, that beautiful and wonderful environment. Great, we have a few questions about how many AP credits can be transferred in. Diane, could you address that? Sure, there will, uh, really isn't a um, maximum amount of units that can transfer in. Um, some of them honestly end up sitting in your free electives if they don't meet a particular requirement in your course. So we take all of your AP credit and then it just depends on how it actually fits with your degree. So some will meet a general education requirement, some may meet a support course in your degree, um, and others may just be listed as a free elective and not meet a specific degree requirement. Great. Another question that may be specific to you, Diane, is Cal Poly going to accept past, no pass grades for spring grades on their final high school transcripts? So, so this is for students transferring into Cal Poly. Um, that may be more of an admission question than um, what I know, but yes, if students have met a course requirement at their high school and that's how that's the only option for grading at this time then that will be accepted as part of their process for admission and coming to um to cal poly Dr. Richard, Kellogg, i don't know if you have more to add to that yeah i, I believe that that's the correct case i mean if the student has no control over the grading process at their institution now, given the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, the university will take the grades, however the institution is, is um, handling that at this point. Dr. Cavalletto, here's a question for you. We have some questions about if you are a, a dual language speaker, so for example, if you um, are fluent in Spanish, are there opportunities to take courses or, or uh, internships that allow you to practice that while also being in your major? Yeah, so we, we do have through the College of Liberal Arts, there are a number of, uh, uh, there's world languages department, so there are a number of language and cultural classes taught uh, regarding uh, a variety of languages, so there's opportunities to build and work on that. And then there's also opportunities through uh, study abroad to go to a number of foreign countries and to be able to use um, your second language in those countries. For example, we have a, a faculty member in agricultural business that um, taking a, a group of students down to Mexico. And so as part of that, they were going to spend uh, about three weeks at a language school. And then the remaining 10 weeks would be out uh, working in the industry and, and learning more about the uh, agricultural businesses in Mexico. So it was an opportunity to get some language skills, culture, and also discipline related. So there are a number of those opportunities. I might add uh, that there's a lot of companies uh, and organizations 
uh, NGOs that if you um, are a, a you know dual language um, person that has other skills in other languages, that companies are always looking for those kinds of young people to do internships and just to expose them to these various things. Uh, and I know, it, you know on the agricultural side, it's definitely that way, but um, it's, it's, that's another great opportunity. Dr. Cataletto, we have a question about pre-law. Are there many students in the college that are on a pre-law track? Uh, there are a few that are doing that, uh, and it comes from a, a number of different areas. Uh, we typically have uh, one or two out of our bioresource and ag engineering that want to look at uh, water law, and so they're, they're coming at it from that way. We've got some that are from our in our agricultural business uh, program that are pre-law and also our environmental sciences area is another one that uh, tends to be popular with people that are looking at environmental law so um, there are from an advising standpoint if that's what you're interested in the, the advisors can help point you to um, the programs and help you understand those requirements that are needed so that you can be competitive in uh, applying to law programs following your um, education here at Cal Poly. We have a few questions about housing off campus and if students who live in off campus housing, if they recommend um, bringing a bike or if the bus service is easy to use. Julia, could you start the answer? Yeah, so um, in regards to housing off campus, um, I think it's really important to kind of um, well, I guess I'll start this off by saying that housing off campus sadly is a little competitive, but the way you can minimize that competition and make it easier for yourself is by starting to make connections with people. Um, and then they can sometimes pass down their apartment or their house to you. But um, in regard to um, transportation off campus, so I don't have a car um, as a second year, so and I'm living off campus, but I always I have my bike and I always use the bus system. So as incoming freshmen or transfer students, when they come to campus, they get their poly card. And through our student fees, that pays for the bus system for us for um, all four years, basically. So you're able to take the bus downtown to um, local grocery stores, um, but it's definitely a more sustainable option for transportation. And I definitely try to utilize that whenever I can. Kendra, do you have anything to add? Great, we have some questions about quarter plus. Dr. Cavalletto, can you address that? So quarter plus is a, an opportunity for students to come in um, during the summer and take a, a couple of general education courses to get acclimated to the university a little bit earlier than the fall start. Um, that program, um, it has not been decided whether that will be face-to-face you know, -face this summer or virtual um, yet, uh, but as we get closer, that decision will be made to how that will handle it. It is an opportunity for uh, students to get a taste of what it is to come to Cal Poly, get their, uh, get their grounding here uh, before the, the busy fall quarter starts. Diane, here's a question for you. Can transfer students add a minor to their degree? So a lot of answers regarding curriculum um, is it depends. So it really does depend on the individual student, what they have coming in, what the minor is. Sometimes minors, as we've talked about, fit into other degree requirements. And you could do what we call double counting, where maybe you're taking a class that fits somewhere else in your degree, plus it doubles as a minor course. So that would help you be you know, most strategic to get that accomplished. And minors range from 24 units to maybe about 32 units. So if you plan it out correctly, 
Um, maybe you can do it in the exact two year period or it can take you perhaps an extra quarter. Again, it totally depends on the major, the classes the student have brought, has brought in and um, the minor they're interested in. So as a transfer student, definitely your first quarter, I'd say sit down with your academic advisor and look at the options and plan it out. Since we've talked about minors, just so students know, you can go to catalog dot calpoly.edu and you can look under programs and all the minors offered at Cal Poly are listed with the specific courses required for the minor. So if you want to um, over this time before you you start fall quarter you can do a little research on your own and maybe start to narrow down those minors you may be interested in. Circling back to the quarter plus session, I wanted to make sure everyone was aware that there will be a quarter plus session later this week, Thursday at 4 p.m. So refer back to the virtual open house webpage and be sure to register for that. Uh, Dr. Prince, we have a question about summer undergraduate research program. If you are participating in that, do you live on campus or do you live in other housing? We do not have any of our summer undergraduate research um, students living on campus unless they already live in our ag housing. So no, you'd need to find places off campus for that, at least at this time. Great, and we have a question about, is it possible to switch majors outside of the college or within or outside of your department? So can you switch to another department or another college? You can, definitely, and it's the same process campus-wide. The individualized change of major agreement works the same if it's within your college or if it's to a totally different college on campus. So it's this um, same process of needing at least three courses, usually about three courses, um, certain grade in those classes, and a either certain quarter GPA or Cal Poly cumulative GPA. And again, if you, another resource for students would be advising.calpoly.edu, and there's a lot of information there regarding um, the change of major process and requirements for each major. Great, and that is about out of time. Dean Thulin, any final comments? Well, I just wanna thank everyone who joined us today. I really appreciate you taking your time from your busy schedules to see and learn a little bit more about our college and about Cal Poly. I hope we've, uh, we've shared some useful information and uh, I wish you all the best of luck making your college decision. And for sure, we hope that you'll consider uh, Cal Poly very strongly as your top priority. Um, I also wanna thank the students and the staff and, and my associate deans uh, for uh, working with this and all those uh, Haley and Jared and others who helped to put this seminar uh, this webinar on so thank you all I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a good next week thank you